guys, thank you so much. And we're watching the markets in advance of the breaking news here. Now, these are the minutes from last month's meeting, after which, of course, the Fed cut interest rates. And the question is, what will happen next time? Is there any indication from the minutes about what will happen in the future? Hi, everybody. I am David Asper. And I'm Liz Clayman. Thanks for joining us. Those minutes could provide us with a lot of insight as to the Fed's worries about inflation, housing, and whether another rate cut could be coming. And let's check the markets as we wait for the Fed's announcement. Now, Liz, you and I were talking before we went on. It was down a lot further than it is now. It is negative, but just barely. It's down four points. The Nasdaq, uh, NASDAQ is down as well uh, by also a very slight margin. Okay. In the left corner of your screen, we will be putting up the Dow Jones Industrials the whole time so you can actually see that reaction. But with just eight seconds to go, Dow's down 13 points. NASDAQ is slightly lower. Let us go to Adam Shapiro in Washington. He's got it. Adam. Liz, there is some optimistic news in this report. Inflation is going to drop in 2008. Unemployment is under control, won't go over 5 percent. And GDP, although it is slowing and going to be lower than it is right now in 2008, will begin to recover in 2009 and then recover again in 2010. This is according to the Fed's forward-looking projections. Let's get right to the first graphic with GDP. 1.8 to 2.5 percent. That's what they're projecting in 2008. That's a drop off of where we are right now. Remember, third quarter of this year, we were at 3.9 percent. The Fed predicting that we will hold it somewhere between 2 and 2.7 percent in 2009 and 2010. Then let's look at unemployment. Unemployment is going to remain, according to the Fed, below 5 percent for the next three years. This is a pretty significant number because essentially the Fed is striving for full employment, and you almost have it here. In 2008, they're predicting unemployment to be 4.8 to 4.9 percent. That is a slighting increase over where we are right now. It'll hold steady in 2009 and then drop down a bit to 4.7 to 4.9 percent in 2010. Then let's look at inflation. This is crucial for every one of us, 300 million Americans. We are right now running at about 3 percent inflation. Next year, inflation drops to 1.8 to 2.1 percent. In 2009, we're looking at about the same, 1.7 to 2 percent, 1.6 to 1.9 percent. The bottom line on this, according to the Fed, is that inflation, this is, this is everything in in terms of inflation, fuel, housing, everything you spend a penny on, inflation is under control and actually dropping over the next three years. Now, as we take a look at the Fed's projections, there's some important quotes to, to listen to. And specifically, the Fed is concerned about the impact of the mortgage problems and the housing market on this economy. I want to read you the first quote we've pulled from the summary of economic projections and hear what the FOMC is thinking. They say that the potential for a more more severe contraction in the housing sector and a substantial decline in house prices was also perceived as a risk to the central outlook for economic growth. Now, this is key. This is what they're thinking about as we go forward because they want to keep full employment. They want to keep inflation under control. If you look at the previous meeting, the minutes from October 31st, you hear almost the exact same thing when they decided to cut the federal uh, funds rate. The quote from that meeting on, on October 31st, almost exactly the same. The potential for significant further weakening in housing activity and home prices represented a downside risk to the economic outlook. That was their reasoning in part as to why they cut the federal funds rate a quarter percent. The bottom line on this report inflation not only under control, but the Fed predicting that inflation will drop. Think of it in terms like this. If you're averaging a 3% raise every year, you're going to be beating inflation according to the Fed. There's lots more in this report, David. I know that you and Liz want to jump into it, so let's have at it. Adam Shapiro, live from Washington. Adam just gave us pretty much the most important uh, points here. And now we want to ask, what can we really learn from the Fed minutes as the Dow, the Nasdaq, and S&P all turn positive? Let's go straight to our panel to find out. Independent trader Eric Bowling joins us along with Charles Payne from WStreet.com, Mike Ozanian, national editor from Forbes, and Victoria Better Barrett, also from Forbes Magazine, associate editor. So Eric, first to you, bottom line, any indication as to what the Fed might do at their next meeting? Well, you know, they gave sort of an innuendo recently that they may not move. And I don't think anything has really changed. The interesting part is this is a look back. This is, you know, a look back at data as of October 31st. Nothing has really changed. I don't see anything that's jumping out that says uh, the world has changed, changed dramatically that they may go ahead and move. I, I think the Fed funds have priced in now an 80 percent chance of a move. 
earlier in the week, or I'm sorry, earlier last week, it was up to 93 percent chance of a Fed move December 11th. I, you know, this kind of tells me they may hold for at least mm. this this one, I, which is, by the way, I think is bad news for the market. We also have Peter Schiff of Euro Pacific Capital and the author of Crash Proof. Peter, from what you've heard that Adam just announced from the Fed minutes, what do you think the Fed is going to do next? Not what you think they should do first, what you think they're going to do. Uh, you know, they're probably going to cut, but, you know, I would take those minutes and throw them in a trash can. They don't mean a thing. Uh, the inflation is nowhere near 3% now. It's a lot higher. And next year, it's going to be even worse. This is not information. This is disinformation. That's all the Fed does. They have an agenda. Their agenda is to try to create confidence in our financial markets, to create confidence in the dollar. But it's not going to work. We're in a real serious mess here. And it doesn't matter what the Fed says. We're not going to get out of it. Well, the, the one thing, Charles, that we should point out on page 12 is Adam, is, is Adam still with us? Adam Shapiro is not. Okay, Adam was telling us that on page 12 there's talk about a credit strain coming. They are concerned right. about a credit strain. Now, to me, that would mean if you're worried about a credit strain, that leaves a little room for lowering rates. It leaves a little room, but, uh, you know, to Peter's point, uh, I don't see where they try to, ro you know, try to make this all rosy or rose-colored gla glasses. If, we, if that was the case, we wouldn't have had the emergency rate cuts that we've had so far. But to Aaron's point, I do feel like, okay, they are giving us somewhat of a forward-looking uh, you know, more of a forward-looking projection than we had before. This is really fantastic news, the idea that inflation can be contained. So they do have to cut, then they have the elbow room to do so. But from what I just, my initial reaction would be that they're not going to cut in December right now. Mike, um, one of the things they said was uh, they're worried about more severe contractions in the housing market. Yet, Ben Bernanke says, oh, it'll be over by uh, spring of 2008. I'm sorry. I see the disconnect here. What's going on? I agree with David. I'm not saying what the Fed should do, but if I had to guess what the Fed will do, and based on these minutes, I think the Fed is more likely to cut than not. The reason is that that will help the banks out and the financial institutions the most. They make their money from the spread. They take the deposits, they pay out a low interest, the lower the better for them, and they uh, lend out at long. So the greater that spread, the better it is for banks. And I think for the Fed right now, the credit crunch is their main priority right now, today. And Victoria, this is your colleague who's against a rate cut. Am I right, Mike? That's so, right. I'm not saying this is what they so should do. So he's, he's reading the notes and suggesting there may be room for one, even though he's against one. What do you think? Well, I think our issue here is that the dollar is really weak already, and any further cuts to interest rates could weaken the dollar further and eventually lead to inflation. You know, the Fed is trying to predict what's going to happen six months, a year from now, but the reality is it's very hard to tell. And inflation could really, really throw away a lot of the economic growth we've been seeing so far. That's my concern. I wasn't as concerned a couple of weeks ago, but I'm starting to see that the housing debacle really threatens the overall economy at this point. Eric, as we're looking at the markets here, the Dow is now down about 26 points. It had popped up just slightly in the wake of the minutes being released and when Adam kind of led people through that. But as you look at their prediction, the GDP won't really recover until 2010, above 3 percent. Does that worry you at all? Well, I, no, no, because I, I think a, a 3 percent GDP in the U.S. is not bad. That's pretty darn good when you think about it. We have low inflation. Unemployment is running fantastic. Wages are going up. All things are... By the way, they it, said lower. Than, they said 1.8 to 2.6. So that's significantly lower than well, 3. But, but that's okay. You know, I mean, we've had some robust, robust years of growth. The last five years have been fantastic, north of 3%. This is okay. The market, the economy can take a breather as long as... Unemployment doesn't get out of control as long as we have a tight labor market where wages go up and people continue to spend. This is okay. The rest of the world will continue to grow and make up for our lack of growth. This isn't a bad thing at all. Hey, Peter, uh, I'm going to throw you a big softball here. <laughs> two words or two, two companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Freddie Mac is down 30% today. Fannie Mae is down 24%. Between the two of them, they hold about $4 trillion in these mortgage-backed securities and mortgages themselves. Does their crashing today, the stock crashing today, foretell something about the future in the housing well, market? Well, it should. I mean, in my book, Crash Proof, of course, I predicted that both of these companies would go bankrupt. And I, I stand by that prediction. But this should be a bombshell. This should be letting people, the Pollyannas on Wall Street, who've been saying that the subprime thing is contained. These are not subprime mortgages. These are conforming loans that are going bad. And this is just the beginning. And remember, when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guaranteed these mortgages, they guaranteed trillions in, uh, in adjustable rate mortgages where they only qualified the 
the borrowers at the, at the teaser rate. They didn't care about the resets. Right. And the resets are all going to be coming in the next few years. And the real question should be, what about the implied guarantee? When these companies go bankrupt, is the government going to try to stand behind it? And if that's the case, this is going to make the SNL bailout look like a Sunday school picnic. Well, maybe it took the markets a few minutes to really digest it and get indigestion. But now you look at the Dow Jones Industrials down more than 60 points. <laughs> you know, I doubt Peter Schiff has anything that he really wants to say about the U.S. dollar. Um, actually, no. Peter always wants to comment about the dollar. Let me just tell our viewers that today the dollar is pretty much steady versus the euro, even in light of the Fed minutes. Uh, right now, the dollar is at a dollar forty-seven. 89 against the euro, Peter. Yeah. Uh, I hate to tell you, I hate to disagree, but it's not steady. It's plunging to a record low, not only against the euro, but against the Swiss franc. This is the first record high for the Swiss <laughs> franc in some time, and that's a real flight to quality a currency. But you know what this means if OPEC starts pricing oil and other currencies? This is really an end to America's free lunch. You know, Eric said earlier that it wasn't the weak dollar that was pushing up oil prices. He, he's wrong on that. It is the weak dollar, but it's also the weak euro. Even though the euro's at a record the high against euro. the dollar, Strong it's, euro, right? No, no. It's nice. the, the euro is losing ground against gold. See, the problem is we are exporting our inflation all over the world. Because we're printing so much money, all the world's central banks are being forced to print a lot of money, too, to prop up our currency. That's what's generating inflation worldwide, and that's why oil prices and gold prices are both rising. It's all because of the inflation that the Federal Reserve is creating and that we're exporting to the rest of the world. By the way, and we, the want, the we want Eric to get in here to answer your charges, but first, I've got to ask ask you, Peter, do you believe, as Ron Paul does, that in a perfect world, we should all be able to have our own currency? We should just manufacture, get rid of the Fed, get rid of its ability to create dollars of any kind and circulate whatever currency you want. Well, I, I support Ron Paul. Uh, you know, ah, <laughs> but, I had an idea that happened. <laughs> but, you know, I would like to go back to a constitutional money. I'd like to go back to a gold standard that served our country very well for many, many years. When we went off the gold standard in 1970, really, that's when all these inflation problems began. Began. It's true. That's when all these, you know, phony bubbles were blown up in the stock market, in the real estate market. We wouldn't have all these problems. We wouldn't have hundred dollar oil if okay. we were still on a gold right. standard. Just, just don't take us back to the time before refrigeration. <laughs> Eric. Remember, we did, we, the refrigerators were developed under a gold standard. A lot of good things were invented with a gold standard. All right. Uh, two, two real quick observations. Number one, OPEC's not moving away from the dollar. That was two wackos. You had Ahmadinejad and Chavez recommending, and the rest of OPEC was smart and said, no, we're not going to do that. We're holding too many dollars. If we move away from that, you're going to hit the dollar even further. So I don't think that's going to be the case. Peter, you have charts, right? Take a look at the chart of a dollar since 2002. It's straight down, straight down 25, 30 percent since then. Take a look at the Dow chart since then. Straight up, up 70, 80 percent since not, then. Take but, a look at the price of these. This is not a do, this, a weakening no. dollar is not a problem yes, it is. for the U.S. You, economy. You, a slow wait. Come and drift down is fine. It what do you think I said this before? Export. What do you think the Dow is priced in? Bananas? It's priced <laughs> in dollars. If the dollar's going down, I don't care what that chart says. People who own Dow stocks are losing money. You know, ah, the Dow is not right. going up this fast. Dollars going economy. down. Hold on, Pat. Go ahead. We are in a global economy. We are not just in a U.S. economy. If we, if the dollar continues to fall, it makes our exports that much more attractive to the rest of the world. Europe is having a big problem because they can't export because the euro is strong. So the dollar is is um, a mixed signal here. It has good side and a bad side. It's not a mixed I, I signal. It's all bad. Hold on. It's all bad. Hold on. It means Americans are getting there. There are others here. Go ahead. Mike. I've never seen a country in the history of the world that's managed to continue prosperity while its currency has continued to fall. The problem, Pat, with a falling dollar is now a lot of our companies, particularly tech, that do their manufacturing overseas, now they're starting to have to pay more for those products to be made. So there is a downside to that. And I think, you know, one of the telltale signs today was Office Depot reported bad earnings. And I think we're starting to see some of the trickle down economic effect hitting small businesses, which are the linchpin of well, our economy. You know, but you're quickly, throwing that quickly. on the dollar. It's not the dollar. We are in the fifth year of an economic recovery. Economies slow. They just do whether the dollar is falling or whether the dollar is rising. Economies slow. Eric, you want to get very, in very here, quickly, but uh, five seconds. Mike's, Mike's comment about Global growth outside the U.S. is exploding, and that's okay. where the U.S. companies All are right. selling those. Getting well, as you get set to head to the airport this
Let's get back to our panel to see what they think about this. We've had a little more time to chew things over. Eric Bowling. There was a word from the 70s, stagflation. That meant you had low growth but high inflation. Is it possible that somebody like Honig, one of the, the reserve presidents who's, who's very pessimistic about the future, he was against the rate lowering because he was worried about inflation. Is it possible that we could have both higher inflation and lower growth? Well, I think the Fed has pointed out that, that inflation is under control. Let's say inflation does start to increase. You're probably Peter laughing at I this, but, so, yeah. but I let's sorry, say inflation is increasing. One of the caveats in stagflation, everyone talks about it when, when things like this come up, you have to have declining employment. It's, it's in a, it's an environment where people aren't working, they're not making more money, and they're not spending. That's stagflation. This is not the case. We have a tight labor market, and that really is the caveat here that's going to keep us out of what I think I think is going to keep us out of a recession is Charles, that type of labor market. Charles, do you like employment where it is right now, unemployment rate? And the Fed says it might uptick just a tenth of a percent. Absolutely. And I thought that probably was the best thing of the whole thing. You know, the fact that they can see out for the next couple of years is staying under 5 percent. I agree with Eric. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, employment is the key. You know, even for the recovery of the housing market and for everything else, uh, consumer spending, yeah, even when people's houses go down, if they have a job and their real wages are improving a little bit, they're still going to shop somewhat. The consumer's not going to fall off a cliff, not just yet, I don't think. But, Pat, it's sort of a good cop, bad cop here. I've got to point out some of the negatives. I mean, if, in fact, we have an economic slowdown and if we're not able to sell as much overseas as we used to be able to, you're going to have more, more unemployment, right? Well, you are going to have more unemployment, but I think this is, this is just something to be expected at this stage of the economic recovery. And when you consider the Fed lowering rates, they're not looking at the impact it's going to have in November and December. They're looking out into next year. And I actually was a little pessimistic when I saw they've lowered the rates and they're still only expecting that the growth is going to be under 2% for the upcoming year. That's a very, very modest growth rate, and it is a little risky for them. Peter, what do you think about the growth rate that they're projecting? Well, it's all nonsense. I mean, first of all, we're already in a recession. doesn't matter what the numbers say. It's going to get worse. And inflation is already probably as bad as anything we had in the 1970s right now. And it's going to get worse. You hit but, the nail but, on the head, Peter, stagflation. Peter, recession is a contracting of we are, gross we, domestic We are contracting. But it's two just, quarters in a row. No, because the government is underestimating inflation. They're also padding the GDP. You know, if, if we calculated inflation in the 1970s using the same CPI today, the government would have reported 2 and 3 percent inflation throughout the entire decade how, of the 70s. How high will unemployment go, Peter? Well, I, I mean, the way the government measure it now, when, when people are not looking for work, they're not counted as unemployed. I mean, so I don't know how many people are already That's unemployed true, that, that, that are not being picked Peter, up. Peter, I love you, brother. I have a question for you. Do you pay your taxes? Yes. Do you pay more than you're supposed to? Probably not. Americans don't pay more than they're supposed to. Tax receipts are increasing year after year, quarter after quarter, not of because course. people are paying in advance. They're paying because they're making. Growth is here. Don't deny it. We're not in recession. Don't listen to Peter. We are not in a well, recession right by now. By the way, by the way, we, there is a very specific definition for recession. It's a definition that's, that's defined not only by two right. quarters, but a lot of under, other indices. There is an organization which decides when we are in a recession. So just by definition, unless, Peter, you want to create a whole new thing, which what is I'm something kind of lower but, growth, we're not the, in a recession. But the numbers well, are not accurate. accurate. Out too about the numbers recessions. are wrong. The last two recessions we've had have been so short-lived, you know, about eight months each compared to historically when they've been as long as 30 months, that I think what we've had is a nation that can respond quickly to a recession, monetarily, you know, from the Fed and from the federal government. You know, that's something to really consider. I don't think we're going to a recession. I agree with Eric. But if we did, if that was the worst-case scenario, I think we would snap you know, out of it that is, really that quickly. Is, that is part of the problem. Those recessions should have been allowed to be a lot more severe than they were. The Fed pushed off those problems by creating a lot of inflation. They blew up this housing bubble. Now we're going to have to suffer a far, far deeper recession because of what the Fed did in 2001 and 2002. Pat, there are people who say that the Fed mishandled certain things as far as the housing bubble was concerned, right. and that's why we see the problems that we see today. Yeah, I, I think that they're, they're looking at it with perfect hindsight. I think when you look at the Fed's actions, right? exactly, I think when you look at the Fed's action, you have to look at the environment in which they were operating. They were looking in, at a post-9-11 environment where we did not know what the outcome was going to be. We did not know if the consumer was going to pull back completely. So I think the Fed may have caused some of this problem, but it was really inadvertent in relationship to, they were trying to 
solve a different no. a different problem. I was one of the people Peter, who was Peter, warning about this. Peter, 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 I, I, I've got to tell you, I, I have a really hard, it's just me. I have a really hard time uh, with not using facts to support my opinions. Okay, hold on. We'll be right back with much more on Fox Business. <laughs> thing that's been weighing on this market tremendously is a huge drop in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, those mortgage security firms that the government actually started up. The government still has a stake in it. They've been down about 25 percent each one of them. Liz. And then you pair that with Countrywide Financial, which is down close mm. to 11 percent. All kinds of issues there that still are getting shaken out. Uh, and it just makes for a big troubled housing market. And these company stocks are getting hurt today. Freddie reporting a $2 billion loss for the third quarter, saying it's seriously considering cutting its fourth quarter dividend in half. And Fannie Mae reporting big losses just a little while back. Our Fox panel is back now to talk about how to interpret all of this. Charles Payne, uh, this is a huge potential problem because, well, yes, last week we talked to the president about it. He said if Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac do go under, the Treasury can't let that happen. They have a responsibility because of the historic relationship between the government and these institutions to come in and bail them out. Yeah, but you know what's so incredible is that they've gone to great lengths from the inception to always say we're not backed by the government, we're not backed by the government, but... Uh, you know, the government may have to step in. And I think one of the big, big problems is I think the ultimate solution to the housing problem that, I, for me, at least, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were going to play a role in that. In other words, right now they buy mortgages up to 417000 I was hoping that at some point they would raise that to as much as a million dollars because we are seeing pressure on the higher end. It's no longer just a subprime issue. If they don't have any money to do that, then, you know, that, that could be a serious, serious problem. And obviously we can see there's been a lot of great news out today for this to overshadow all the great earnings that we saw last night and this morning tells you something. And the markets tell you something, too. Dow Jones Industrial is up about 12 points, so they have now climbed back. It's been more than a, what, 225-point swing, considerably more than that today. So it's been, Eric, quite a day for the markets. And when they see Fannie and Freddie, maybe it affects them at 11 in the morning. But when Asman and Clayman come on, <laughs> they figured it out by then, right? Look, 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 I think the best way to go at this is for the Fed to continue to lower interest rates. If they continue to lower the rates, things are going to solve themselves. The, the, look, back in the old days, you borrowed money, you were subprime, you couldn't pay it off, but your house increased in value, you refinanced, you paid it, paid it off, and you moved on. You can't do that right now because the real estate market is flat to down. Look, you continue to lower the rates, you're going to solve the underlying problem. Fannie and Freddie will be okay. They won't, they won't need a U.S. bailout. Well, Peter, try to keep it on Fannie and Freddie, please. Don't go off into the dollar or the other stuff. But talk about the fact that, that Fannie, let's just take one of them. It has a capital base of $40 billion, supporting $2.8 trillion book of business, including the $2 trillion in mortgage-backed securities. They're not all subprime, a small percentage are subprime, but they've got this $2.8 trillion book of real estate products. How does it survive? It, it, it can't. I mean, the only way it can survive is if it can get a cash infusion. It's going to have to find someone dumb enough to buy a bunch of equity and, and infuse cash into the company, but even that might not save it. I mean, th th this is a huge, huge problem. The losses are going to be horrendous. And, you know, the dollar does factor into it because a lot of the buyers of these mortgages are foreign. They're Europeans. They're Asians. And, of course, they're looking at the value of these mortgages also through the prism of their own currencies. And as they keep cutting interest rates and weakening the dollar, they further diminish demand for our mortgage products around the world. So credit is going to keep drying up. It's going to be harder and harder for anybody in this country to get a mortgage to buy a house, which means home prices are going to plunge. Right. We're just starting. You so, know, one, one thing that is interesting, though, delinquencies for these guys is only 0.51% from 0. Point. It's, not the link, it's not that people aren't paying. What hurts Freddie Mac keep in mind. was the fact that its assets declined so dramatically. But people are actually paying their mortgages. That is not the big issue for Freddie Mac. Right? Okay. That's now. Well, Wait till next We're year. We're going to hold it there for a second because as we are watching the markets once yeah. Charles, I mean, yeah. does Detroit really need to get more European or Japanese in their thinking to get out, to get back into the game? They, you know, it's interesting because they are going to have to, they have a big PR game ahead of them because, you know what, they can catch up in terms of quality, but the general perception will be that European cars are better and Japanese cars are better. So that just tells you they got to go the extra mile when it comes to public relations. But Pat Powell, let's stick up for Americanism. We <laughs> like big cars. We like cars that hold the road, et cetera. This is a pretty car. 
not gone forever, no, are you? No, it's a pretty car, and it does come in other colors. You know, you don't have to just take the one color. But Cadillac, I, besides this particular car, Cadillac represents that American big size. Does yes. that have a future at all, or are we stuck with the small cars forever? Well, I, you know... I don't know whether we're going to go back to Cadillacs or not. I kind of think of Cadillac as my father's car, not necessarily as, as my car. And I think that that's a perception that, that Detroit has to overcome. But I think becoming Car of the Year on Motor Trends magazine is a big deal. There's a, they have 1.1 million car aficionados. My husband is one of them. He is going to be salivating over this car when we go home. What do you it, drive? What do I drive? I drive an Acura. Okay. And what does your husband drive currently? A Mercedes. Okay. See? Well, there. And, and uh, why? General Motors down again. It's down another, to, you know, two percent, I believe. You know, it doesn't you know, matter. There's great news about Cadillac and GM's down you know, it's, again. It's troublesome. It's a capital well, intensive. brought back zero, zero percent financing. Right. I don't know if that has anything to do with it today either. You know, it's just maybe a sign of desperation. <laughs> Labor costs. It's a capital intensive industry. It's very difficult to turn a buck in, the, in this industry. Hey, and that's is, why. is Peter Schiff still with us? No, I don't think so. I'd, I'd love to know what kind of car he drives. We'll, we'll get an answer to that. I we'll bring know. It back to it is, I know. Is Eric, okay. Is what, what does he drive? He drives a convertible Who's BMW, that? and he also has a Saab. I know that because my kid plays with him. Oh, Peter, car. you're there. Peter, I just outed you. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. You don't drive American, Peter. Well, you know, I can't help it. You know, I mean, if they if they make a car that I actually wait a minute, you know, my ex-wife has a Cadillac. Oh, oh. So when, when we were when we were married, we bought that car. So. Is that what, is that why she's your ex-wife? <laughs> no, well, she she liked the Escalade. I don't know. She wanted it. We bought it. Gas guzzler. Well, Eric, Eric I mean, you look at it. You look at say, for example, the Escalade. They're coming out with a hybrid version of it, supposedly. That's, Are they getting smart? No, no. I'm sorry, but these hybrids <laughs> don't pay off. I mean, you do the math on this. Unless you drive 25 thousand miles a year it you can't yeah. even pay for a hybrid over the next 10 years and frankly yeah, the it, GM cars don't last 10 years Sorry, if you own a lot of oil stocks you can afford it <laughs> <laughs> I, I, bu I bought I put extra money in oil the day we bought that uh, that Escalade <laughs> well, actually, it was still about 30 bucks a gallon or 40 dollars I think so. I have a Chrysler 300 yeah. which is a cute car but a terrible engine and I have a Navigator that I drive on the weekends with the family. Oh, that's a guzzler. It is, it is. But you know what? I love the safety. When I'm in there with my kids, I've had people hit me in that thing without a scratch, and their car was like an accordion. So I feel like I pay more for gas, but I feel great Can't that my kids are safe. Can't you just see Charles going, ah, <laughs> Oh, by the way, I don't use a rear view mirror either, you know, because when I'm in that thing, I'm the king of the road. All <laughs> righty, <laughs> <laughs> gang. All right, so I guess the consensus is yeah. Let's stay away from the stocks. General Motors at a 52-week low today. Yeah. Is that a pickup? opportunity Peter huh is that a buy on the dip <laughs> no, no stay away stay away, stay away. <laughs> four two it's nice to see Peter smiling smile. isn't it I tried yeah. to smile all right well are you tired Here we go. Markets are up about 61 <laughs> points with just about eight minutes left in the yeah, trading day. Yeah, it's turned positive, folks. And as I said before, the NASDAQ is also positive as we look at the Dow Jones above 13,000. Remember, 13,000 was that floor yeah. through which the market had crashed. Some people thought it would go down to 12,000. But bucking the trends, bucking the experts, you got to love it when the experts are wrong. They may, may not be wrong forever, but they were certainly wrong today when they said it in negative because we just have seven minutes left. And it looks like it's going to be positive. This is an even niftier trick with the Dow being up 60 points when you hear that crude oil ended the session at a record and it is trading even higher right now in the after hours market. Right now it's at about 98.45 and it ended at 98.03, I believe, $98.03. So uh, even so, the market seems to be brushing that off. So let's go to our panel right now to talk about this, David. We start with the man who knows oil better than anybody I know anyway, which is Eric Bowling. Uh, Eric, is, you see the future just continuing to go up and up and up for oil. I have to ask, I just got to do it, is this because you're betting on it to do that? No, no, not at all. In fact, I have very, very few, I have a few integrated oil companies, which, by the way, I do not recommend you own integrated oils. I think there are better Define ways to play Define integrated oils. Integrated oil is a company who, the big oil companies that BP, bring oil Shell. out of the ground, BP, Shell, Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, they bring oil out of the ground, they refine it, and then they sell it to you. They have that whole integration of the business. I don't think you should do it. I think oil prices are too much of a factor in integrated oil. I have a small piece, small piece of the portfolio in that. I do think oil prices are going to continue substantially higher. We're at $98. We're going to see $100 tomorrow 
giving one slight amount of bullishness in that inventory number, oh, bullishness to the oil price, yeah. you're going to blow right through $100. You may see $150 given any sort of geopolitical unrest. Tracy Burns on the floor. Mama, talk to us about the action here. I'm telling you, Liz, this market is about as predictable as my three-year-old. When we started this day <laughs> off this morning, we had bad news. You know, you get the Fed minutes. You had the financials in the toilet. We got a rumor about uh, Countrywide oh. shutting its doors, which, you know, that could still prove itself. Then we have service coming out saying the Chrysler deal is not going to happen. Everyone thought we were going to end under 200. And here we are. We're up. I, I still say it's you guys. You're our ray of sunshine. But the other theory is that the market is being very resilient. And as much as this is all news today, it's not new news. So once it's digested, the market kind of settled back to where we started. And to Eric's point, it actually it's surprising to so many people. You know, we have oil up so high, yet why isn't the market reacting similarly? Again, I come back to my three-year-old. Don't know why she flips out sometimes. That is exactly where this market is, you guys. Back to you. Perfect, Charles. Well, you know, I, I, on, over the weekend, OPEC met, and King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia more or less said he was doing us a favor by having oil at 100 bucks. He said he suggested that $100 was really low. So to me, the fix was in coming into the week. And I agree with Eric. I've been pounding the table. I tell folks out there all the time, you can get angry when you go to the pumps and kick the pump if you want. But you know what? You might as well have some exposure to oil. I mean, I've been talking about the drillers and the servicer, which I think are great places to be. But I don't know, 150. Ultimately, it could even go higher than that. But the fact of the matter is, what I do like is the fact that stocks can go up with oil. For a long time, I've said that at, at some point, maybe it's a headwind. But right now, I think it's actually a reflection of our economy and the global economy more so than a headwind, and that's why we've seen oil and, and, and the stock market have broken out well, over the last Peter, four years together. Peter, Tracy says she doesn't know why. Actually, it reminds me of <laughs> that song, Stormy Weather. Don't know why. There's a cloud up in the sky. But you know why there's stormy weather, right? Well, sure. You know, yeah, the Dow is up a little bit today in dollars, but in everything else, it's down. You know, Liz, you might not like gold cars, but you got to like the metal. It's up over 20 bucks today. Look at the gold stocks. Look at Newmont. I mean, look at Barrick Gold up over 8%. Bucks. 803 yeah, Barrick bucks is, for gold and Yeah, Barrick cents. is up over 8% today. You know, Freddie Mac dropped the bombshell on this market today. I don't know why it didn't blow. I, I don't think it's a dud. Maybe there's a long fuse, but I think there's a huge decline coming. Like I said last week on this show, there is tremendous risk in this market. There's a lot of downside to come. Uh, there's a lot of complacency out there. There's bad news coming. There's bad news today. The market is ignoring it. But if you look at what's happening in the foreign exchange markets, if you look at what's happening in gold, and you know, there's a lot of these bonds guaranteed by Freddie Mac okay. and Fannie Mae all over we the got, world. We They're not going to be Peter, too excited Peter, when they wake up tomorrow. Go, but five seconds, what do you say? What's going to happen? You know, I think the stocks that are being penalized are the ones that deserve to be penalized, financials, countrywide. I think it's a, it's a market of stocks not a stock market. Long-term investing. Thanks, Pat. Thanks to our panel. And the closing bell is just minutes away. Stay with us.